Hi, I'm a higher ed CMO and I have a confession to make. I am incredibly nervous about the enrollment cliff. I am really worried that a lot of institutions are not going to be able to survive the changing demographics of our country and the reduction in the number of people who are expected to graduate from high school and head to college in the coming years. I'm hoping that this episode gives you and others insight into what we can do as marketers to help our institutions survive these challenging times. Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO, the podcast designed for higher education marketers. I'm your host, Jamie Hunt, and I am so excited to have this opportunity to share insights and inspiration. With Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO, I'm designing a different kind of podcasting experience. With each episode, I'll be bringing in a guest for a deep dive into the challenges and joys we all face in higher education marketing. After each episode, you can join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag HigherEdCMO. I would love to see this become like a book club, but for a podcast. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at at JamieHuntIMC, that's J-A-I-M-E-H-U-N-T-I-M-C, for more opportunities to connect. I'm really happy to be here today with Carrie Phillips, who's the CMO at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Hey, Carrie, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to talk to you about your dissertation, which was on the enrollment cliff. But before we dive into that, why don't you tell me a little bit about your higher ed career journey? Absolutely. Well, this is my second career. I have a, I started in television and did that first. Um, I don't know that anybody necessarily grows up and says, oh, I want to be a higher education marketing officer. Um, it's one of those things you just kind of find along the way. Um, and so after I did the journalism thing for a while and was producing television news, I stumbled into this via social media and really fell in love with higher ed and the ability to do work that matters and to have that opportunity to make a difference in the lives of our students. And so did that at my alma mater and was there for several years, had the opportunity to go from the assistant director of new media, which is where my husband joked that I played on Facebook for a living. Um, <laughs> if only it were way. that easy, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, but started kind of in that entry level role and then eventually was promoted and had the opportunity to lead that department and did that for several years. Uh, moving internally was something that was really important to me, uh, but that also sparked my other passion, which is leadership, because I think it's so important that we model the the great leaders and the great mentors that have shaped all of us. And so I did that for a couple of years and had the opportunity to really work across campus to build synergy and relationships uh, for our marketing and communication work. And then in April, I started my newest adventure, where I'm serving as the Chief Communications and Marketing Officer at UA Little Rock. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on your new role. Thank you. Thank you. I'm loving it. And congratulations on completing your dissertation. That is a big lift. Um, Thank you. It is a village for sure. (laughs) So what you wrote your dissertation about the enrollment cliff. What made you want to tackle that as a topic? I think that's a great question. Going into the program, I had kind of two possible ideas. One of them, this was one of them. Uh, But what really spoke to me about that topic is when I was first kind of being a leader in an office, I realized I don't know enough about what other areas on campus are doing, and that's really important. And so I started going out and learning about other areas. And so I was at an enrollment management conference and heard about this enrollment cliff that was going to be happening, and I knew nothing about it. And I went and talked to some of my other marketing colleagues at other institutions, and they knew nothing about it. And I quickly realized we need to be talking more about this from the marketing side. Mm -hmm. And so this dissertation gave me the opportunity to help tell that important story to our marketing colleagues and to help say, here, we have a valuable seat at the table as part of this conversation. So I have um, read through, not word for word, your dissertation, but I have read big chunks of it. And we're going to do kind of a deep dive into your research. But first, can you give me sort of a high level overview of what you did in um, in this paper? I guess... 
book length work. <laughs> yes. So I looked at uh, how regional public university chief marketing officers suggested or talked about that they were preparing for the enrollment cliff. And I had a lot of a varied findings, but I do think it kind of boils down to four key things. The first is really understanding what is the role of the marketing office. Um, I think that was a key part of it because for us to be able to use marketing to be a possible strategy toward the enrollment cliff, we have to understand first off what the marketing office is doing and who it's working with, who it's collaborating with. So that was the first thing that I really tried to understand as part of this. I also think I really saw the importance of campus and presidential or cabinet level support of marketing and how important that it is for the entire university to understand the value of the work for that, those folks to be successful. Another major finding was the importance of differentiation and branding and how that really helps to tell the entire university story and how we have to be really collaborative in that space. And then finally, just looking at all of the challenges that higher education is facing and how marketing might be able to help with that. This is just incredible stuff and stuff that we're <laughs> We talk about all the time, I think, as higher ed marketers, but maybe not Absolutely. always in the context of the enrollment cliff. And yeah. I'm wondering, from your research, what role do you think marketers can play in addressing this challenge that's looming before us? I think we have a unique opportunity, and I think that's really where we can be the change agent. Marketing and communication, I think more than anybody else across campus, works with everyone. We work with admissions, we work with advancement, we work with individual colleges and departments. And so because of that, we sometimes see things that are happening before the rest of campus sees it because of, as we all know, silos exist in higher education. And <laughs> That's so I my, think all... my brand is busting silos. So <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, but I think that's part of our responsibility or our opportunity, whichever way you want to look at it, is that we sometimes see processes are clunky. We see where an experience maybe doesn't live out our brand message and our brand pillars. But because we're the person that sees that, probably more so than anybody else, I think we have the opportunity to gather folks in the room and lead the conversation and start talking about it as an entire campus. I love that idea. That I talk about marketing um, as being that connective tissue where you have this yeah. high-level view and everybody's problem ends up being a communications problem or communications has a role in that. And the enrollment cliff, that's just a... It could potentially be an existential crisis for an institution. Yeah, and absolutely. I love your take on why marketers need to be involved with that. I was going to say, I think that's it exactly. I think, you know, we have that unique opportunity that not everybody else has. I think sometimes we've maybe been a little bit timid to own that space. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's fair. So how important is it for universities to convey the value of higher education in general as part of this challenge? I think it's critical. That's something that as I was talking to the CMOs in the study, CMO after CMO after CMO told me, you know, higher education has a perception problem and we're not able to articulate our value. And where I think that comes from is a couple of things. I think one, there are a lot of other credentialing opportunities that exist that didn't exist years ago. I also think the job market is really tough right now in terms of we have lots of of job opportunities. We have lots of people that are unable to fill positions. Mm -hmm. And so from a higher education perspective, if we're going to be able to explain to a student the value of coming to educate, to achieve education, maybe go in debt to do so, we've got to be able to articulate the benefit that they're going to get out of that. And I think benefit can kind of be three different things. I think first off are those job skills, those credentials, those things that they're going to actually be able to do a particular job. But I also think we sometimes focus so much on that that we miss talking about other things. So things like the ability to set goals, to make a plan, to stick to them. Those are really important skills. The ability to think critically, to mm. solve problems. You know, those are skills that we also provide opportunity for and help teach when students are pursuing higher education that we don't always talk about how that value adds up. Those are some things that we need to be able to do a better job of articulating how we help. I love that. Do you think as we're talking about 
the value of higher education, it seems like Gen Z is a little bit more interested in the process versus the outcomes, like the journey of getting a degree is as, or maybe not as important as the outcome, but really, really important. Do you see a place for us to talk about that experience of higher education as conveying that value? I absolutely think so. You know, we talk about experience as in how you're going to grow, how you're going to change. When you look at some of the data, it seems like higher education is really split in what is the purpose. So about half the folks say it's to to teach you a trainable credentialed skill. That absolutely has to be part of it. The other side of the house is saying, we teach you how to process information, how to come at a problem. And I think that piece really hits at that overall experience of a university, experience of new ways of thinking, experience of exposure to new and different ideas. So in your dissertation, you talk about the way higher education has embraced change, but more specifically that it has not. So why do you think that's a challenge as we face the enrollment cliff? So one of the things my mother always told me growing up when I would get frustrated at things is you can't do the same thing and expect a different result. And that used to irritate me so much, but it's not wrong in this case. You know, with higher education, having about 400,000 fewer students starting at that enrollment cliff time, 2026 or 2027, depending on which data you look at, competition is going to increase. There are going to be fewer students. There's going to be more competition for those students. And so I think if universities, if we keep doing exactly the same thing, it's going to make it really hard for every single university that exists to stay relevant. Hey all, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO. I want to take just a quick moment to thank my friends at Nectar who made this new Enrollify podcast possible. Nectar brings affordable communications infrastructure to college campuses. It's like Slack, but for the higher ed student experience. Nectar integrates seamlessly with all major LMSs, making it easy for instructors and administrators to build emergent learning communities in all of their classes and groups without the extra work. Their focus is on boosting student engagement and reducing instructor stress by building a learning community in every classroom. By leveraging familiar technology like instant messaging channels, Nectar prepares students for the remote yet collaborative work environment of the future. You can learn more about their platform by heading on over to Nectar. That's N-E-C-T-I-R dot I-O. And be sure to tell the team that Jamie sent you their way. Are there things that you think that universities should be considering making changes to as we head towards this challenge? Absolutely. And I think Part of that that we have to be very careful is no one size approach is going to fit everyone. I think it's really important to look at the culture of the institution, to look at the mission of the institution. But I think gone are the days that institutions can be all things to all people. I think we're Mm going to see a lot more niching in the marketplace. I think we're going to see institutions say, this is really what we do and what we do well. And we're going to maybe not do some other things that we've historically done. Or, you know, we're going to look maybe a little bit more at the return on investment and what the market data tells us about programs before we just add a lot of other programs. So I think we're going to see a lot more intentionality about what we do and how we do it. But the outcome of that, I think, will look a little bit different institution by institution. That segues me really nicely into my next question, which is, um, why is it important for CMOs to be in conversations around academic program offerings and pricing? I think that's really important, absolutely. And I can give you a couple of examples. So I think we've all been in conversations where we're talking about promoting X program and the marketing team says, well, what is the cost? And the conversation probably goes something like this. Well, if you're in state, it's this. If you're out of state, it's this. If you're online, it's this. If you're this group, it's this. That makes it very difficult from the marketing team's perspective to be able to try to share a message that's easily understood in advertising and in those types of settings. So I think where marketing can help in a pricing conversation is maybe offer a different perspective, to offer that perspective of we have six to eight seconds to get a prospective student's Mm. attention in advertising. And if we have to explain all of these different ways, that may not be the best fit. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but at least offer a different approach. I also think marketing has access to some analytic data that can be really helpful when talking about 
the, the programs or the, the things that we're looking at marketing. So I can give you a, a good example there. I had, an ins- I had a program in an institution and the web organic data told me that that program was our number one driver on the academic programs pages. So out wow. of all the academic programs that the university offered, that was the number one program in terms of organic traffic month after month after month. So the market was clearly searching for that program. However, I was also being tasked to invest additional marketing dollars into that program because it was on the non-viable possible list for low enrollment. Hmm. So the market and what we were seeing in enrollment weren't matching up. Hmm. And so from a marketing perspective, because I had a seat at that table, I was able to say, wait a second, these two things should not be happening together. So maybe there's something we need to finesse about the program. Maybe we need to finesse how we talk about it. But our data shows us the market is very interested in this program. Why is it then the market is not interested in our program? That is really interesting. So what did you, how did you crack that nut? What did you do? Um, so they're doing some finessing on some messaging to help clarify part of it. But then I also think it made a really strong case for maybe looking at an additional program that better suited the other side of that, ha- that need. Mm. That's really interesting. One of the, the things that I'm discovering, um, I'm on the academic program incubator um, committee at the institution I work for. And we look at the programs when they're just in that raw proposal stage. They have not even fleshed out a full proposal. And one of the things that I always like to look at is like the Google trends for the program name. Because we have some people that want to have really creatively named programs, right? Like they don't, well, everybody calls their program this or that. yeah, because that's what people search for. So so we have a, a program, I'm not going to out them here, but um, where the name of their program has gotten, it's just a flat line on Google Trends. Yeah. And if you search for the old name of their program, it's tons and tons and tons and tons of searches. And they're wondering why their enrollment has dropped by about 30% in that program. Like, because you're losing a lot of organic search traffic. But they didn't think to ask a marketer before they um, made that change to their program name. So I think I think there's a lot to be said about our skill set. And I think those are things that you're right. No one, it's never a, a thing. It's just people don't think about that role. And so I think as marketing and comms folks have more and more opportunity to be at that table, I think we just have a different perspective that sometimes may help a program to make a fine, fine tune adjustment, nothing significant, but that could have significant impact on the success of a program. Absolutely. And I wish I could get my hands on the name of just about every program and <laughs> just say like, let's, let's rename all of these to something that people actually search for. Cause I don't know about your institution, but for ours, organic search is actually the number one driver of requests for information. Yeah, it is huge. It is a huge And we've done a lot of great work with program pages to make that work for us. And so I Mm -hmm. think having those opportunities, you're absolutely right to fine tune and right, right fit things where you can is critically important. Yeah. So kind of pivoting to a, a slightly different topic, but something that you talk about a little bit in your dissertation, I've noticed, and I'm sure you have as well in your higher edge career, that university marketing offices are really wildly divergent in how they're structured. And in a lot of cases, the CMOs don't actually have responsibility for recruitment marketing. Do you see that as a potential issue? I think it can be. Um, But I really think it goes back to the culture of the institution. So I am talking with folks in my dissertation and in those interviews, I had two schools of thought. Some people very much like to keep those separate and have a dotted line between the the admissions team and the marketing team because they felt like from the marketing perspective, if they weren't directly over it, they had better opportunity for collaboration. Mm -hmm. Other folks had a different perspective that they wanted, you know, it was more important to have those working where one had direct responsibility for the other. 
I don't think mm-hmm. that there's a right or wrong. I've been in both environments. I think what has to happen at any institution is there has to be a strong collaboration between the marketing group and the group that oversees enrollment, whether that's admissions, a graduate college, however that works. I think there has to be a really strong step and connection there so that each group knows the strategy, knows is making sure that tactics support that strategy, making sure that messaging happens. But to me, that can be executed in a multitude of different ways as long as that relationship is there for the high-level strategic piece. I think that's the the trick to it is having that. Yeah. And I have talked to colleagues who have, they don't even speak to their enrollment, um, chief enrollment officer, except when they have to. And I just don't understand yeah. how you can have a mature marketing organization and actually drive revenue if you don't have that relationship. Absolutely. You know, that was something at my prior institution. We met every single uh, Thursday at two o'clock for about the five years I was um, actively involved in that role. And we had a great relationship. Um, Same thing at at the institution where I'm at now. We meet on a regular cadence, um, have regular conversation, and very much work uh, lockstep. Hey, all Zach here from Enrollify. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. Our shows feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Mickey Baines, Jeremy Tears, Jamie Hunt, Corinne Myers, Jamie Gleason, and many, many more. You can learn more about the Enrollify Podcast Network at podcasts.enrollify.org. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea. Find yours at podcasts.enrollify.org. It makes a huge difference. It absolutely does. I've been, um, like you, in both situations, and I... For those who maybe haven't listened a couple episodes ago, I talked to the the chief enrollment officer at Miami for the podcast, and we talked a little bit about our relationship. And it's it's funny because we're in president's cabinet meetings, and the president is sort of saying, these are your goals, and pointing to both of us. Yeah. Like the, the revenue generation goals rely on both, and the success of one relies on the success of the other, really. Absolutely. So... Um, marketing offices have changed a lot over the past de- decade. And I, I've been in higher ed for about 18 years, and it's changed dramatically since I, I first started. Why do you think that change has been necessary? I think that change really happened because of a couple of things. I think first, we're continuing to see increased competition. We're seeing in a lot of places this whole idea of state support is waning for higher education. And because of that, we have rising tuition costs. And so when you look at kind of those three historical things together, what that creates is institutions that are tuition dependent. And so we have institutions that rely on student revenue from tuition dollars to remain viable as an institution. And so because of that, I think what we start to see is universities then put in specific culture and specific systems into practice as part of their institution to help with that. And I think one of those is formalizing the marketing and communications team. And so I think that's why you Mm -hmm. see a lot more uh, formalization of that office, a lot more responsibility charged to that office, because it's a system that's helping to adapt to that need for tuition revenue to help the university secure the resources it needs. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not always, um, the tuition dollars aren't always the only source of revenue. It's making a case even for lawmakers to make a greater investment. You're absolutely right. So I think it can be the legislative piece and making sure that we're making our case there. I think making our case to alumni and to our donors, I think private philanthropic support, whether that's writing a grant or seeking a major gift, I think those things are more important now than they have been. And all of those things to be successful have to have that nuanced message. They have to have a a message that draws an emotion. But I think they also have to tell a compelling and consistent story. And I think doing all of those things together is really where marketing and communications can be helpful. 
one question I, I didn't sort of warn you okay. that I was going to ask you, um, but one of the things that we're seeing with the enrollment cliff is also a demographic change. Yeah. So we're seeing um, a growth in the number of Hispanic yeah. students um, and a decline in the number of white students. Are there any particular um, challenges that face universities that maybe haven't thought about being um, Hispanic serving institutions? I think any institution has to be very intentional about the work that they do. You know, it's very difficult for any institution to change a population that they serve overnight. You know, whether that is we're working with an institution that, um, you know, wants to be a Hispanic serving institution. Well, how do we make sure that we're, we're communicating? Are we putting things in various languages? Are we providing additional support staff? Um, I was talking with someone earlier this week, and they talked about they were doing an ad set, and and they were wanting to target a Hispanic population. Yet when folks called to ask questions about it, they had no one in their office who could speak mm-hmm. Spanish to be helpful. So I think it's thinking about all those little details and nuances that are going to be really important to make a student feel welcome. So if they're coming to campus, are there are there food opportunities where they feel like they're getting what they would get at home. You know, we have to think about it from not just the academic side, but the student success and student support side. And those initiatives take time. And so I think if that's something that we haven't as an institution started talking about, that's something that whoever might be listening, that institution really needs to start thinking about now because putting those practices in place to make sure that the entire student feels welcome is something that's going to take a little bit of time. I love that message of making sure that they're going to have a a welcoming campus experience that meets their needs. I think that's a piece that we sometimes can leave off. We'll just put some Spanish language ads out there and call it a day and, and not do that sort of cultural check on our own campuses. And then I think students, if they have a bad experience, they're going to tell their friends and family, like, you have one chance to get it right, I think. Absolutely. And I think it's not only do they tell their friends and family, but then we have, you know, what if they come and they don't stay? Then, you know, have Mm -hmm. they taken out loans? Have they, have we then put other obstacles in place that make it difficult down the road if they want to come back? So I think it's so important to do that work on the front end and look at that from the entire student perspective to make sure we, we do get it right. I, um, I may bring my senior director um, onto the podcast to talk about what we're doing for multicultural marketing, but one of the things that he did was about a year before we started advertising to um, Latinx students was pull together a group, a multicultural task force that could help us make decisions about um, what's the message? Um, what is the experience that they'll have on campus? Where should, where do we find students? Where's the right place to be doing the advertising? Um, working through translation, making sure that our brand copy is culturally relevant and and appealing. And rather than just sort of throw out some Spanish language ads and hope that that means we're going to get more Hispanic students, um, taking a more intentional effort. Absolutely. I think that's a great strategy. So what would your recommendations be for our listeners? Um, as we look down the barrel at 2026, what would you recommend that CMOs do? So three things. I think first, start talking about it or keep talking about it. So I think be that change agent, start pulling your people together if it's not happening. I think sometimes we feel as though we need permission as marketers to bring Mm -hmm. folks together. And I don't, this isn't a time to be timid. Uh, We see this, we recognize this. And I think this is our opportunity to pull folks together and make that those conversations happen if they aren't or make sure that they continue to happen. I also think we have to make it easy for people. Um, And so I have an analogy that marketing is similar to recycling. And so go with me on this journey a little bit. Okay, Um, okay. But I think if you ask anyone, people tell you recycling is good, I want to do it. I think marketing is the same thing. If you ask anyone on your campus, oh, it's good, we want to be part of marketing, we want to help. Until it gets difficult. When you're having to separate the glass from the plastic, remember what things you can wash, check which plastic numbers your recycler will accept, make sure you sort the paper. When it gets difficult, people just throw it in the trash. 
And so I think marketing mm. is similar in the sense that if we, you know, drop a 40 or 50 page brand book and say, you need to follow this, we don't do any, do ourselves any favors. I think it's getting out, talking to people, building campus relationships. Maybe it's doing a lunch and learn about how we can work together. Um, whatever that may be, I think we have to find ways that we make it simple so that we can take people on the journey with us because intuitively everybody wants to be part of it until we make it difficult. I love that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. And I think the third thing is to remember this is actually a, a really exciting time. You know, marketing more than any other time in our history, we're needed, we're valued, we're getting more and more opportunity to be in the room where these conversations are happening, to be part of those conversations. And so I think it's important that well, yes, there's a lot of work to be done. I think it's important that we communicate what an opportunity we have. Because if we get this right, I think we have the, the ability to position ourselves to be an important part of university in, the, in those spaces for years and years to come. And so I think it's really important that we as leaders message to our people as we're talking to our teams, this is important, but this is an exciting moment for us because I think mm -hmm. our teams are looking to us to set the tone of the conversations. When I think when I think back to, you know, 18 years ago when I started my career, I wasn't thinking about being able to make an impact on the institution that would contribute to its continued viability. Like that is a big yeah. That's a big responsibility, but it's also a responsibility that I think should make you feel better about your job. Absolutely. You know, we have the opportunity to really do work that matters. And I think chances are that's why most of us ended up in this field is because we love making a difference. Yeah, absolutely. When we think about the mission-driven work that we're doing, um, we certainly, in most cases, could make more in the private sector. But we believe so strongly in the mission that we're, that's why we're committed to this type of work. Um, so that is, that's really exciting. Are there any other um, tips or advice you can give to CMOs? I think the other kind of final last thought that I would say is keep learning as well. Um, you know, I, and don't laugh at me for this, but I set on my calendar, I have the LMAC committee. And it's the, it stands for the Leave Me Alone Committee. And I have that a couple of <laughs> hours every single week on my calendar. And that's just time that I'm reading or time that I'm learning. Uh, because I do think the field, especially given how much MarTech there is, the field is ever changing. And so I think it's so important that we as leaders continue to be learning and model that for our teams, but also because new strategies and new tactics and new opportunities come on board weekly, monthly, daily. And so I think that ability to continue to learn and grow is something that's going to serve the entire profession really well for years to come. So you've written about your dissertation. Where could people find some of your writing? Absolutely. So I'm on LinkedIn, um, but I also, so after you write a dissertation, you have this moment of what next? And uh, for me, I couldn't figure out how to stop writing. And so I actually created my own website. It's and Carrie on.com. And so that's where I'm just kind of, as, as the spirit moves, uh, sharing my own thoughts there because I haven't figured out how to stop writing yet. And then certainly going to be doing uh, hopefully more presentations about this in the coming year as well. And will people be able to hear you speak anywhere this year on this Yes, topic? so I am actually really excited. I'm going to be speaking at AMA, at the Higher Education Symposium. That's actually been something that I've attended for several years and always looked up to the presenters as these, these great role models in the field. And so I'm really excited to get to share this work at um, AMA. It'll be in the virtual conference track and kind of the research track. So I'm really excited that even if you can't make it to the, the conference, that you'll be able to engage virtually as well. And I've seen Carrie's proposal for the conference and it's gonna be fantastic. I think you will greatly enjoy it. So I hope I hope to see you there. I will be at AMA. Um, so I'm hoping to see lots of listeners there. So any, any other closing thoughts on um, this enrollment cliff and what we can do? You know, I think my final closing thought is the lift in front of us, it is heavy. There's a lot of, as you said, responsibility, but what a fun, exciting challenge. I think our field and I think our pro professionals are ready. And so I'm excited to see what the next 10 to 15 years looks like. 
And then Carrie, can people find you at all on Twitter? As you may know, we use the hashtag higher ed CMO to have conversation around the podcast. Can people find you online? Yes, I'm on Twitter as well. I'm Carrie H. Phillips. And so, yes, hit me up there as well. Awesome. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. As usual, you can find me at Jamie Hunt IMC on Twitter. That's J-A-I-M-E-H-U-N-T-I-M-C. And you can also track me down on LinkedIn at Jamie Hunt, same spelling. And um, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Hey, y'all, Zach here from Enrollify. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Confessions of a Higher Ed CMO with Jamie Hunt. If you like this episode, do us a huge favor and hit that follow and subscribe button below. Furthermore, if you've got just two minutes to spare, we would greatly appreciate you leaving a rating and a review of this show on Apple Podcasts. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. But Enrollify is far more than just a podcast network. Enrollify is where higher ed comes to learn new marketing skills, discover new products and services, and find their next job. We're a growing learning community of 4,000 members, and we'd love to welcome you into the fold. You can access our free blog articles, newsletters, e-courses, and more, or purchase our master course on how to market a university with Terry Flannery at enrollify.org. We look forward to meeting you soon and welcoming you into the community. Again, you can subscribe for free at enrollify.org.